Greetings, salutations, and words of goodwill. Um, welcome back to another video in my series on early Christian heresies. The heresy we're covering today is the big one, so to speak, namely Arianism. I call it the big one because it created a very significant centuries-long conflict within the church, and it motivated the writing of the Nicene Creed. And while there are heresies that are worse than it, opposition to it kind of became the definition of the mainstay of Christian orthodoxy, um, to some extent, even to this day. The other thing about Arianism that's important, before we get into actually what it is, is that it's the first or maybe the second in a series of back and forths between two ancient schools of patristic theology. Um, so before we go into what the heresy is itself, we ought to start by covering those schools so that we have an idea of the backdrop. Now, as I said, these schools are schools of patristic theology. So we would do well to sort of describe what patristics is. And basically, patristics is the study of the early church fathers. So more or less, those theologians which precede the Middle Ages although people prefer to give ecclesiastical designations to these time periods. So usually it's said that uh, the patristic period ends at or around the Second Council of Nicaea in 787, although some people want to give a much earlier end date at the Council of Chalcedon in 451. Uh, personally, I think that's silly because then you have a huge chunk of theology with essentially no name. Um, and that would mean that people like Maximus the Confessor and John Damascene aren't patristic uh, theologians, and that also seems stupid. But I'm going a little bit too deep into the weeds there. Uh, the point being that as Christianity begins to become a large religion and spread significantly, it begins to develop its own cultures and institutions and way of doing things. And uh, one of the thing that, things that develops is that in the eastern half of the Roman Empire, so in Eastern Europe, and there develops two major centers of Christian theology. And these two centers get called the Antiochene School and the Alexandrian School. Now, in Alexandria, there literally was a school, right? There was a catechetical school um, called the Didascalium, where there were classes and teachers and a curriculum and courses that you took. Whereas in Antioch, there wasn't so much an institution as there was just a series of smaller institutions which uh, had scholars that would obviously interact and work together living in the same place and being interested in the same topics. And it shouldn't surprise you to find that in these two different schools, you get different focuses of theology, slightly different opinions that become prominent, um, and different ways of approaching the doing of Christian theology and the Christian religion. Now, the differences between these two schools is more significant than what I'm about to say, but for our purposes, it's sufficient to know, A, that they exist, and B, that the Antiochene school tended to focus on Christ's humanity in its theology whereas the Alexandrian school tended to focus on Christ's divinity in its theology. And in and of itself, there's nothing wrong with that, right? Because Christ is both human and divine, and uh, you could probably spend pages and pages and pages talking nothing about, uh, talking about nothing but his divinity and still not be done, and perhaps vice versa. Uh, however, the isolated focus of these two centers uh, resulted occasionally in veering too far to one direction, and perhaps in the Alexandrian school, forgetting Christ's humanity altogether, or in the Antiochene school, forgetting his divinity altogether, or denying his divinity altogether. And we've actually seen this play out already in the previous video uh, to this one in the series where we discuss Docetism, because Docetism is a theology that comes out of Alexandria, and as we've said, as we said before, it says that Christ's humanity was simply an illusion 
It just seemed to be real. Which is a problem, and we've discussed why that is. But you can see how that is a straight-up denying of his humanity, and so an exceptional focus on his divinity. And it comes out of the Alexandrian school because they are so focused on their divinity there that it's possible to lose sight of his humanity. Today, we don't so much have a response to docetism in Arianism, but we have the opposite problem taking place. We have an excessive focus on his humanity, which is why I say that Arianism is the first, maybe the second, in this sort of back and forth between these two schools, between Alexandria and Antioch. Um, I don't think that Arius is directly responding to docetism in his Arianism, um, whereas which is why I say that he's only sort of the second. Docetism came first, and it's a mistake, but most of this back and forth following Arianism will be responses if one side to the other, each side trying to show the other where it is that they're becoming excessive. And in the greater scheme of the church's theology uh, involving Christology, trying to find the balance between these two uh, realities of Christ's being, his humanity, and his divinity. With that as a bit of a six-minute intro, uh, we have now the capacity to move to Arianism properly. But in order to do that, we have to discuss the man after whom it is named, who was Arius. Arius is an interesting figure because he is a priest in Alexandria. However, he studied theology in the school of Antioch. But, being a native of North Africa, he returned to Alexandria to uh, prepare for the priesthood, and being ordained in the year 310, he started what was originally a very successful career. His bishop was very happy with him and quite excited because he was an excellent public speaker, a very good preacher, and he would draw the crowds in. People would come to just hear him speak, right? And so, in that sense, uh, people are showing up to church, uh, they're listening to the gospel, Everything's great. Everybody's excited. But then the current bishop dies, and he's replaced by another bishop whose name is Alexander. And he, as is appropriate to his name, is a thorough Alexandrian theologian. And he gives a homily in which he describes Christ's divinity and how it is the same as that of the fathers. And Arius understands this sermon in his Antiochian ears as a previous heresy, which I realize I need to do a video on because I haven't discussed yet, called modalism, uh, which we'll simply say here, uh, says that Jesus and God the Father are in fact the same person, um, not simply both God, but actually the self-same individual person, that there is no difference between the Father and the Son. We simply use different names to describe God when he's acting in different ways. Now, that's almost certainly not what Alexander was saying, because that theology is not predominant in Eastern Europe at all, but is really more of a Western European problem. But be that as it may, this is what Arius hears in Alexander's uh, sermon or homily. And so what he does is he begins to express an alternative theology to the bishops which is going to get you into trouble to begin with. But the theology that he expresses is summed up in this phrase, there was a time when he was not, saying that there was a time when there was not the Son. Now, that is obviously going to very greatly distinguish between the Father and the Son and protect you completely from any sort of modalist tendency. However, what it suggests, not even suggests, what it states pretty clearly is that if Christ came into being in time, and I don't mean like Jesus born at Christmas, I mean like the second person of the Most Holy Trinity in his divine state came into being in time, then he is not God, but he is simply a creature. Now, maybe the most badass, awesome of all creatures, so very close to God in his nature that it's, Almost better to call him a god than a creature, but a creature nonetheless. Now, this is a problem because it's really just another way of denying the Trinity. 
right? There's only one God, and that God is one person, and the Son and the Spirit are just not God. It's also a problem because it causes Arius to be a Judaizer of sorts, because he's suggesting that salvation is achieved not by God, but by a creature. And therefore, God is not necessary for salvation, but merely the right interaction with creatures. Now, needless to say, this uh, direct confrontation of the bishop doesn't go well for Arius. And Patriarch Alexander of Alexandria and a series of other bishops in northern Africa hold a council in which they discuss Arius' ideas. And at this council, Arius is condemned. And this takes place in 320, 10 years into his uh, position as priest for the Patriarchy of Alexandria. And in response to this, Arius, rather than recanting, simply moves closer to Antioch, to the city of Caesarea, where he's accepted as a faithful Orthodox priest and continues his ministry as a priest and his champion of this theological position regarding the nature of Christ. Now, this particular heresy is unique in a sense. First, because it greatly divides the church. After all, there already was this divide between Antioch and Alexandria, and uh, this is sort of formalizing that divide. But additionally, um, it's one of the first major heresies to arise after Christianity's legalization, which has taken place uh, in the year 313 under the Emperor Constantine in his Edict of Milan. And Constantine has this goal of making Christianity really the religion of the empire. It's part of his political position to add to the statements, uh, one God, one faith, one baptism, one empire with one emperor, which would be him. And so he sees his political position wavering as, this, uh, as the question of whether or not there is one faith um, and one church really begins to become a problem when, with this Arian heresy erupting. And so he comes up with this idea of an ecumenical council where he's going to call all of the bishops in the empire together, and they're going to have a big meeting, and they're just going to solve it, and then everyone's just going to move on, and we're not going to fight about it anymore. So he organizes this big meeting just outside of his brand new capital, Constantinople, in a little town uh, called Nicaea, which is really more of a suburb of the capital than its own independent place. And all the patriarchs of the East come. Uh, the Pope's not capable of being there, so he sends his papal delegate, who has the awesome name of Hosius of Cordova, a name which deserves to be said twice, so we'll say it again, Hosius of Cordova. And as bishops are like to do in councils, they have a big fight about it, and the Arians make their claims, and the other bishops uh, make their claims. And the person who comes to the top uh, of the decision-making at this council, and for the years that follows, is a man by the name of St. Athanasius of Alexandria. And he uh, really champions this word both here and at the next council of Constantinople called homoousion. And the lovely thing about the word homoousion is that everyone knows that the word homo in there means the same, just like in the word homosexual, right? Uh, but no one really knows what the second part, the ousia in ousion, means, except that Arius won't say it, right? And the Arian bishops won't say it. And so as long as everyone agrees to this word homoousion, then Arianism is condemned. And so this word is the decision that the council comes to. They write an earlier edition of what we call today the Nicene Creed. Everybody but two bishops signs the document. All's hunky-dory. Constantine sends everybody's home. And supposedly it's a giant success and the uh, theological quandary is solved. Except that. A large number of the bishops at the council are not happy with this homoousian uh, word for various reasons. Some of them are Arians and some of them aren't. And many of them only signed it because they were afraid Constantine was going to kill them or gouge out their eyes or something. And so uh, many of them go back to their 
diocese and immediately recant and say that was a giant mistake. We don't believe it and sorry, that was just a bad mistake. I was scared and I shouldn't have done that and maybe they go to confession or whatever. And uh, The conflict continues. Now we'll talk about that tricky word homoousion in a minute and precisely what it means and uh, the nature of the continuing conflict in a second from a theological perspective. But let's go ahead and just uh, finish up some historical details and tie it up into a nice little bow. Um, Constantine initially supports the Council of Nicaea. Unsurprisingly, it was his idea. But this is back in his life as a Christian where he doesn't actually care what the answer is. He just wants one so that there's political stability and he can go on being emperor and sun god, whatever else he wants to be. Um, but as he begins to mature in his faith, uh, he is convinced of the Arian position and not the Nicene position, which is what we'll call it right here. And he begins to be discipled in the faith, primarily by a distant relative of his named Eusebius of Nicomedia, who was a personal friend of Arius's and his supporter and fellow student of Lucian of Antioch. And as a result of that, Arius becomes very prominent in the empire, and he has the emperor's support, and he's actually about to be made bishop of Constantinople just before he poops himself to death in 336 AD. Um, and yes, I literally mean that he died from excessive diarrhea. Constantine himself is baptized on his deathbed by this Arian bishop, uh, Eusebius of Caesarea, and the situation gets so dire for the Homoousians, for the Nicene position, that St. Jerome actually says that the world one day woke up and groaned to find itself Arian. And St. Athanasius is given this title, Athanasius Contramundum, or Athanasius Against the World, because he is the only one, quote-unquote, obviously there were others, um, who is still promoting this Homoousian position, this anti-Arian position. Now, uh, Arianism is condemned again at the Second Ecumenical Council, which is the first council of Constantinople. Okay, they have the second one across uh, the water in the capital itself of Constantinople. Uh, and it's shortly after Athanasius' death that this takes place. But even that doesn't really resolve the problem completely. And Arianism remains prominent in certain places up until the 7th century, really, when largely, thanks to pretty much pretty Nicene princesses, uh, it slowly dies away as uh, the barbarian kings cease to support it. Now, let's get into the theology a little bit more in detail. This word that Athanasius comes up with, homoousian, as I said, it's a convenient uh, word because no one really knows what it means, which allows him to create a coalition of sorts. Remember, the councils tend to be compromises. And so he creates a coalition around this word homoousion, and a bunch of people could support it, many of whom did not have the same theology, but whose theology was not Arian. And so you uh, take out the Arians um, only to find yourself with a new problem. So what does the word usia mean? Well, the word usia is the Greek word for substance, okay? Uh, but... Just as substance has many different meanings in English, it has many different meanings in Greek, which is why it's a good translation of the word from Greek, because it's equally ambiguous. In one sense, the word substance means some sort of material, right? If you went into a chemistry lab and somebody had a beaker and you said, hey, what's the substance in the beaker? You'd want to know what kind of matter was in that beaker. Is it water or mercury or lead? Right? Not that that wouldn't be obvious, but the point being that substance can mean a type of matter. And so what one could be saying by saying that the Father and the Son are homoousion is that they're made from the same stuff, that they're made out of the same thing. Now, the reason that substance can mean a type of matter is that it can also uh, mean a type of thing, simply put. So in that sense, it has the same meaning as the English word essence or nature. Now, this usage might 
be obscure to some of you, but in the English language as well, the opposite of an accident is a substance. Okay, an accident is something that doesn't have to be there, that's not necessary, that's not essential to the situation. And the substance of the situation is what makes something the way it is, what makes it what it is, what makes it the type of thing it is. This is how we're using the word when we say that two things are substantially the same thing, which is to say that in essence they are the same thing, which if taken very literally would mean that they have the same qualities that make them the sort of thing they are, so they're the same type. And so in this sense, by saying that the father and the son are homo usian, you could just be saying that they're the same type of thing, which is true in a sense, but you could say that if you believe that there were three gods and you weren't actually a monotheist. Now, in Greek philosophy, this use of the word substance is referred to as secondary substance because it comes out of a much more primary use of the word, which is actually less primary in English and less common in English, which simply means an individual thing. There is the substance of dog, the secondary substance, which is the, the qualities that make something a dog. And then there is the individual dog. And this is actually the original meaning of substance, an individual thing. This is what we mean when we say that something is insubstantial, and by that we mean that it's intangible, right? It's not a thing. Now, in this sense of the word, if you say that the father and the son are homoousian, you could very well be espousing modalism, that there is no difference between them, that they are one person. So this brings us to the correct meaning of this phrase, or at least the most correct meaning of it. And that is something I'm going to call individual secondary substance, which might sound a little bit of a contradiction because, remember, the primary substance is the individual, the individual dog, and the secondary substance is the abstract uh, state of dog, right? The thing that all dogs have in common. But each individual dog has its own dogness you might say, right? The essence of being a dog. Now, I'm not going to be able to define dog here. As St. Thomas says, it's impossible to exhaust the essence of a single fly. But let's just, for the sake of simplicity, say that a dog is a f mammal which is supposed to be four-legged and supposed to bark and doesn't climb trees, right? Whatever. Each individual dog, Fido, Rover, and spot share an abstract dogness the list you might say of qualities that make something a, a dog the idea of being a dog but each individual dog has its own set of those qualities each individual dog has four legs barks doesn't climb trees and is a mammal and this you could call its individual secondary substance or its individual essence, right? It's not the abstraction of those qualities, but the qualities themselves actually making the thing a dog. And in my opinion, this is what the Cappadocian fathers, which I've not discussed because they come later, ultimately draw out of this word homoousion, that this is the correct way to understand this word, that if the father and the son were homoousion in the sense that they were the self-same thing, and that were the most proper way of understanding that word, then that would be modalism. If they were homoousion in the sense that they were just three of the same type of thing, well, then that would be three gods, and therefore tritheism, and not monotheism. But what the father, the son, and the Holy Spirit share is the same set of characteristics that make something a god. And we call that set of characteristics divinity. They share the same specific divinity, the same individual divinity, not simply divinity in the abstract. Now, for those of you who are more familiar with Christian theology, you may not be used to us describing the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit as being one in divinity.
I mean, you might say, well, that's probably true, right? But I'm not used to that phrase. But you are almost certainly used to another phrase, that the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit are, u are united in Godhead, right? That they share the same Godhead. Well, Godhead comes from an older version of the suffix hood, right? The head in Godhead is actually what we would commonly today refer to as hood. So the word originally comes from this theology right here, and what, what was being said is that they shared the same Godhood. And what is something's Godhood, right? It's its divinity. It's its state of being a God. It's nature as a God. And as we're saying, it's specific or individual nature as a God. The set of characteristics that God has that makes him a God, not merely the abstract set of ideas that could be God. Now, in the case of dogs, those aren't the same thing, and many theologians are going to want to argue that, in fact, most, uh, that in the case of God, those are the same thing. But be that as it may, focusing not on the abstract, but on the individuality of that quote-unquote set of characteristics is the way to understand the meaning of this word. Now, because it has so many meetings, it has a lot of people who are opposed to it, despite the fact that they ultimately agree with what it means. So people's positions in relation to this word in the context of this conflict take on uh, different nuances, and there are basically they can basically be categorized into four separate groups. The first being the people who accepted the word, and they're called homoousians. Okay, they believe the Father and the Son are homoousian, are of the same substance, or one in essence. Now, the next step away from the homoousians, and pay close attention here, because when you're talking about the word in Greek, it's with an O, but when you're talking about the people, it's with an A, is homoousians. And the difference between homoousian and homoousian is an iota, right? So you've heard the phrase, it doesn't make an iota of difference. This is the iota, the letter I. And the difference between homo and homoi in Greek is that homo means the same and homoi means similar or alike, right? So the homoiousians who get called semi-Aryans, right, sort of Aryans, want to say that the father and the son are alike in essence. Not that they have the same essence, but that they're alike. And the homoiousians are going to say that uh, for one of two reasons. One, they think that the sun is a creature, but they want to focus on how amazing and awesome he is. And so, like, he's not unlike the father, right? I mean, he's, he's like him. He's just not him right or his substance his his way of being is similar to the father's now the other reason why someone might say this is that they actually believe in the nicene position as it's properly expressed but they're concerned that what is meant by usia here is not this individual essence but just individual right a particular thing and as we've already said, uh, that statement pushed to its extreme is modalism. And so they want to reject modalism, and so they're uncomfortable with this word because they see it as modalist. And actually, uh, it was a word used by a famous modalist known as Sibelius. So, not an unreasonable concern. And since uh, both, you know, moderate Aryans and moderate non-Aryans uh, can say this word, they were considered a compromise party, right? That we could just end the conflict and kick the can down the road if we were just all willing to say homoiousian. Now, the next step from homoiousian is what we call the homoians. These are people who simply want to say that the father and the son are alike. Throw out that whole essence word together, and then we don't have to worry about what it means because we don't know what it means. Um, now, this particular position is neither strictly Aryan nor strictly Orthodox, just like the Homoiousian position isn't. 
most of the people in the Homoian camp didn't like the word usia altogether, right? Whether they believed that the Father and the Son were one in essence, in any sense of the word, or not, is not the question. The question is whether or not we should be using that word, because the word does not show up in Scripture. And so you've got a group of bishops here who could be uh, likened to Bible-thumping fundamentalists who are saying, like, the Bible is all we need, Greek philosophy is bad, it's certainly not necessary, and there's no reason why it needs to show up in our dogmatic statements. Uh, just use what the scripture says. Don't use non-scriptural terms to describe what's in the Bible, just use the way the Bible describes it. Now, some of those individuals are going to be Arian, right? And some of those individuals are not. Now, the absolute opposite of the homoousian position is what we call the Anonomians. And the Anonomians want to use this Greek word, anomoios, which is the opposite of homoios, which we just discussed, right? The an here is like the im in impossible, right? Not possible, it negates. It's actually the same sound as un in unlike. So what anomoios means is unlike. Homoios means like, and anomoios means unlike, not like. And these are the strict Arians. Everyone who's in favor of this position uh, is definitely an Arian because they want to say that the Father and the Son are not like each other. And why would you say this? Well, if the Son really is a creature, right, and not God, then God, who is infinite, is infinitely different than the Son. And so it is more fundamentally correct, you might say, to say that they are unlike than that they are like. And they don't want to compromise with the non-Aryans. And so they're going to stick to this word and insist on saying it. Now, maybe you can get them to say that they're like in other circumstances, but, but this is the fundamental word they're sticking to. Now, as we said, the homoousians eventually win, and that's what's in the Nicene Creed that many Christians, in fact, most Christians say every uh, weekend at church, and has sort of become the bedrock of Christian orthodoxy. So that's where we're going to put an end to it. Um, I might, well, I almost certainly will make another video in the future, assuming I keep doing this, which uh, gets into that distinction between the different meanings of usia, uh, because I'm sure it's not 100% clear, I could probably talk, I've spoken here for about 30 minutes, I could probably speak for a full 30 minutes on that distinction itself. Um, in fact, I have before. So we'll call it a day. Um, again, thanks for listening. Please like, subscribe, comment, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, if you see that I'm below 1,000 subscribers, you got to get to 1,000 to monetize, so... You know, if you found this at all useful, you can just click the subscribe button and never look at one of my videos again. It would still help me out. And other than that, God bless and have a great day.